three years ago, there was a wonderful book published called Connected, the, power, the surprising power of our social networks and how they shape our lives. And it got lots of media coverage, and one of the ideas was if you're in a community with lots of obese people or smokers, that is going to influence you. So the man who wrote that book is both a physician and a social scientist at Harvard, and he's been doing some new research, which he's going to talk about now, about your real social networks. Please welcome Nicholas Christakis. Thank you very much for that introduction. So today I want to do two things. First of all, I want to explore the deep origins of social networks, outlining some new work we've been doing on how and why we're all connected. Because we humans have been making social networks for tens of thousands of years, ever since we emerged onto the African savanna, and not just since we invented the internet. And my colleague, James Fowler, and I have been spending the last 10 years of our lives trying to understand the structure and function of human social networks. But this has led to another question. So what? So what if we can understand how human social networks form and operate? What can we do with this knowledge to make the world a better place? So as an initial observation, consider this. Human social networks, wherever they've been mapped, always kind of look like these images that you've been seeing. Whether it's 56 high school students and their friendships shown on the upper left, every dot is a person, every line connecting them represents a friendship relationship, or 105 college students and their friendships in the upper right, or a set of about 400 people from one European country drawn from 8 million people using cell phones. So we can take the cell phone data in a kind of big data way and process it, see who's calling who, and map their networks in the lower right. That's just a small part of this enormous network. Or on the lower left, a group of 379 scientists and who they are collaborating with. Human social networks, whenever they've been mapped, always kind of look like this. But they never look like this. They never look like a regular lattice. We do not live out our lives in this kind of a structure, nor has any naturally occurring social network ever been found to look remotely like this. Why not? Why don't we humans assemble ourselves into networks that look more like this kind of network rather than the other kind? The striking pattern of human social networks and their ubiquity beg the question of whether we evolved to make social networks and to particular kinds of social networks with particular structures in the first place. And to understand this claim, we need to dissect network structure a little bit first. First of all, notice that in this network, every position is identical to all the other positions. Each person is connected to eight other people. Each of those people is in turn connected to eight others. And if I took this surface and I wrapped it around the surface of a sphere, or more properly, a torus, a donut in, two, in a three-dimensional space, every person would be equally likely to be towards the middle or towards the edge of the network. But real social networks, as we've already seen, look entirely different. And in real networks, people have different locations. For example, consider node B in the upper left. So every dot's a person. Every line represents a relationship. Here, a friendship relationship. Node B in the upper left has four connections. And node D on the far right has six connections. And if you talk to people in the network, they would be aware of this about themselves. They would know, I've got four friends. I've got six friends. I've got no friends. People are aware of how many relationships they have. But now look at nodes C and D. C and D both have six connections. And if you talk to those individuals, that might be the limit of their understanding of where they're located in social space. But we now, with this bird's eye view, can see that there's a very different location between nodes C and D. And I can cultivate this intuition in you by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ was spreading through the network, C or D? D. D, you should have the intuition that you're on the edge of the network. You're going to be less likely to get it, and you're going to be less likely to get whatever is spreading through the network. Now who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip were spreading through the network? C. And you probably, and the formally, mathematically, that's because the mean path length between D and every other node is longer than the mean path length between C and every other node. Now finally, compare nodes A and B. A and B both have four connections, but there's a difference between the two because in A's case, his friend's friends are back again his friends. Whereas in the case of B, the friend of a friend of B's is further away in the network. And imagine now if you were a prehistoric human and your task was to hunt and kill a mastodon, who would you rather be, A or B? A, work together closely with your friends. There's high transitivity. There's high interconnection between the individuals. You can collaborate and kill the damn thing. 
Now, on the other hand, if your task was not to kill a mastodon, but rather to find a mastodon, you would rather be B. Because in A's case, your friend's friend is your friend. Do you know where the mastodon is? No, do you know where the mastodon is? It comes right back to you. Whereas in the case of B, you can reach further in the network. So we have three properties, and there are many more, but just three so far. The degree of a node, how many connections it has. The centrality of a node, how central it is. And the transitivity of a node, how interconnected the friends are to each other. And we did a study where we looked at the heritability of these three attributes, which we published a couple of years ago. So on the y-axis here is the percent of the variance that's explained, or how heritable are these traits. And on the x-axis are these three traits. So on the far left, in the red bar, it says that 46% of the variation in how many friends you have can be explained by your genes. Now, this is not too surprising. Most of us are familiar with this fact. Some of us are born shy, and some of us are born gregarious. There's a kind of innate tendency that people might have to connect with other human beings. And this might vary across us. But in addition, we found that those higher order structures are also partially heritable. So 47% of the variation in uh, the transitivity can also be explained by your genes. This is a very bizarre result. What I've just told you is that if you have Tom, Dick, and Harry in a room, whether Dick is friends with Harry depends not just on Dick's genes or on Harry's genes, but on Tom's genes. Whether Dick is friends with Harry depends on the genetic constitution of some third individual. And we think the reason for this is that people vary in their inclination to introduce their friends to each other. Some of us knit the network around us together, and some of us in kind of worlds collide theory keep our network separate. And finally, even 29% of the variation in how uh, central you are in the network can also be explained by your genes. So the fundamental reality of our desire for connection and our susceptibility to interpersonal influence, it turns out, has always been with us. And where you are in this vast fabric of humanity depends in part on your genes. So if social structure has genetic antecedents, it begs the question of how ancient this structure is and whether we can document such structural features in human populations living in non-modernized settings. Did we always make networks of the same type or do networks or do the networks that we currently make reflect our invention of cities or of telephony or of the internet? And to investigate this, we chose an evolutionarily relevant population, the Hadza hunter-gatherers who live in Tanzania around Lake Ayasi. There are only about 1,000 of them left. They live the way we humans did during the Pleistocene. They make, uh, they're pre-agricultural. They hunt and they gather for their food. They have no material possessions to speak of. They do not make dwellings in which to sleep. They sleep under the stars. And there are only about 600 adults that still live in the traditional way. And with my collaborators, we drove all around 4,000 square kilometers around Lake Ayasi. And we had created a kind of photographic census of the Hadza, a kind of Hadza Facebook. And we took these posters into the field and we asked every Hadzani to identify who their friends were in a variety of ways. And we mapped the networks of the Hadza, and Hadza networks look just like ours. So in every way we could look at these networks, visually and mathematically, the topology, the structure of Hadza networks, is indistinguishable from the networks that we make, despite the fact that we have all of our modern technology. In addition, an important property of human social systems, namely how cooperative we are, how prone we are to be generous or to altruistic to others, which we also me measured among the Hadza, and which is indicated by the color and size of the dots here, seems to cluster within Hadza networks, such that cooperative individuals are clustered with other cooperative individuals and non-cooperative individuals with non-cooperative individuals. And it turns out that it is easier for cooperation and all sorts of other valuable phenomena to emerge and be sustained when people can also control the structure of their networks. So social networks are very deeply embedded in our evolutionary heritage. And all kinds of things can spread across the ties that we make, germs and information, of course, but also emotions and norms and behaviors and all sorts of qualitative things that Stefan was just alluding to, behaviors as diverse as smoking or voting or purchasing, for example. Actually, in a very real way, I think that the spread of germs is the price we pay for the spread of ideas. We connect with each other so as to benefit from the knowledge that other people create, but in so connecting, we pay a price for that, including the threat of violence, the spread of epidemic disease, and so forth. So network structure is not a coincidence. The structure matters, and we are bound by this structure. And in fact, just like our bodies have an anatomy and a physiology that we need to understand if we're to develop effective treatments for diseases, Human groups have a structure and a normal function that we also would do well to understand if we're to craft interventions to make the world a better place. 
Now, broadly speaking, we can take advantage of this knowledge of networks, especially coupled with the opportunities presented to us by the big data world we live in, to make the world better in two broad ways. Because if we can understand how networks form and operate naturally, we may be able to exploit them. And we could use network interventions to affect health, cooperation, innovation, productivity, product adoption, and diverse sorts of other phenomena. So first of all, people's attitudes, decisions, and behaviors depend on the structure of the network around them, the connections. So we can think about interventions that involve changing the structure of the network. How do we rewire the network and in so doing achieve an objective that we have? And second, people's attitudes, behaviors, and decisions depend on what the people around them are doing. And that's an issue of contagion. How, given a network structure, can we manipulate and change the flows of whatever it is that's flowing through the network? And there's expanding experimental science in both of these areas. Let me tell you about a few experiments that, that we've been doing in our labs, uh, James and I. So for example, here's a recent experiment we did where we recruited people using Amazon Mechanical Turk. So there were uh, people all over the world that were paid small amounts of money to participate in this experiment. They sat at their computer screens. And we brought them into the, this virtual laboratory. And we dropped them into networks whose rules, whose algorithms, we had specified and controlled. So for example, in one situation, in the bottom, uh, the individuals were dropped into a random network that was fixed and invariant. And the people played a kind of public goods game, a little cooperative game, where they could contribute to the common good and pay a personal price. Uh, and, but the best thing that they could do for themselves was be to be treacherous and defect and not contribute. But if everyone defected, then the system went to hell. But if everyone cooperated, then you had a cooperative uh, situation, a, a better uh, environment. So the red dots are the defectors, the cheats. And the blue dots are the cooperators. And then these people would play this game, and they would play it again and again and again with the people to whom they were connected. In the bottom, the network was fixed. People were stuck interacting with particular individuals to whom they were randomly assigned. At the beginning, about 60% of the dots are blue. So 60% of the people are cooperative right at the beginning, which is a general observation about human interactions. Uh, and if you look at the system, you see that across time, on the bottom, uh, everyone eventually defects. Why? Because you're stuck with these other people. They take advantage of you. You say to hell with that. And you switch from being a cooperator to a defector. So the rigid network eventually results in everyone being a defector on the right-hand side. Conversely, in the top, we did an experiment in which we allowed people to rewire their networks. They could cut the ties to people that were defectors and preferentially form ties to people that were cooperators. And in this kind of a world, cooperation is sustained, nourished, and persists. So the blue dots persist. And the network comes to assume a particular kind of mathematical structure, which is very interesting to us. So there's a very deep relationship between the permissibility of rewiring networks, changing the structure of the network, and the emergence of this very desirable property, namely human uh, cooperation. Now, it's not just the, uh, the structure of the network or connection that matters. Contagion also matters. Given a particular structure, can we foster the flow of desirable properties, like cooperation, or like voting, or like innovation, for instance, in groups of engineers? If you have a group of engineers and you're trying to get them to be more inventive, how do you construct the environment to them, uh, around them to foster that kind of uh, ingenuity uh, and creativity? Or other things, not just cooperation, voting, or innovation, things like smoking cessation that are related to health. How can we structure networks, or how can we manipulate the flow through these systems? Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a paper we published a couple of years ago. In this situation, strangers were brought into face-to-face -face networks. They were brought into the lab. Uh, and they again played a little public goods game. They could cooperate with the group or defect. They played in groups of four. Uh, and then a bell would ring, and they'd be randomly assigned to interact with new people. And then a bell would ring, and they'd be randomly assigned to interact with new people. And the question here was not, if I am kind to David, does he reciprocate the kindness, a kind of direct reciprocity? Rather, the question is, if I was kind to David, does David then go on to be kind to Stefan, and then Stefan go on to be kind to the next guy? And there's a kind of spreading process, a kind of pay it forward in the network. So you can take these data and reconstruct them into the form of a social network, an artificial network whose topology you've specified. And when we did that, what we found was that if in period one, Eleni was kind to Lucas, in period two, Lucas went on to be kind to Erica, and in period three, Erica kind to Jay, and in period four, Jay was kind to Brecken. And what's astonishing to us about these results is that you can see the signature of Eleni's kindness to Lucas in Jay's interactions with Brecken, even though neither Jay nor Brecken ever saw or interacted with Eleni or Lucas. 
So this is an experimental demonstration of a pay it forward phenomena. How I treat you affects, uh, uh, is related to how other people are treating each other far away in the social system. And in fact, in addition, that's different than Lucas learning to be kind and then persisting in his kindness across time, such that if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, in period two he's kind to Erica, and in period three to Lysander, and so forth. In fact, if you fold back all the downstream kindness that arose for every initial extra dollar that Eleni gave to Lucas, the network functions as a kind of matching grant, doubling the benefits to the population as a result of the structure that exists within the population. So this was in an offline uh, network, face-to-face -face network. Uh, James just published a beautiful paper in Nature a couple of months ago in which he did the, most, the, biggest, human, uh, the biggest randomized control that had ever been done uh, with human beings working on the Facebook platform. 61 million people were randomly assigned to one of two different treatments in the United States election two years ago. Uh, in one situation, they got an infer 60 million of them approximately got an informational message, a message that said, today is election day. And they could click on a button that said, I voted, if they voted. And they could also click on a link that gave them information about what, where their nearest polling place was. About a million of them were randomized to get the social message. In this message, they uh, not only got the I voted button, but also got, actually the numbers I think are reversed, but this, the randomization is those two uh, treatments. They also got a, a social component when they were told about specific friend of theirs, friends of theirs that had also voted. And then if you compare how people's behavior changed, when they got the social message versus the informational message, they were much more likely to vote. So being aware of what people around you are doing increases voter turnout. They were also more likely to search for their polling place. And as part of this study, they also validated voting. So they connected people's I voted Facebook behavior to real voting behavior, which is public knowledge or massive data sets that are maintained about whether or not people vote, not who you vote for, of course, but whether you turn out to the poll. That also mattered. And then if you looked at the social message versus the control, people who got no message, people who were stimulated and got a little notice on Facebook, this weak little signal on one day, one little post on Facebook, resulted in 60,000 people, extra people, turning out to vote. And they, and then, in turn, induced 280,000 of their friends to turn out to vote. An extra 340,000 Americans physically got up and went to the polls two years ago simply because of this little weak little uh, post on their Facebook page, a kind of virtual world inducing a kind of real world behavior, a rather good behavior, namely voting. And there are other strategies that we're exploring in our labs right now to manipulate contagion by doing field trials in the developing world. So we've been doing this in, uh, in Uganda and Honduras, and we hope to do it in India. So imagine that you have two villages, and that you can map the social interactions among the residents of these villages. So the village on the left, that's their social interactions, and the village on the right, that's their social interactions. And now you can target, you have just enough money to target six people shown in yellow on the right with some desirable thing like vaccinating your, your baby or using anti-malarial bed nets or a clean water intervention. Now, ordinarily in a public health framework, what you typically have focused on is, did the six people that I treated, did they respond to the intervention? I came back a year later and three of the six had adopted the intervention. But what we're interested in is not whether the treated people responded, but whether the untreated people responded to the treatment among the treated. So the question becomes, look at the, on the right-hand side, look at the people who didn't get the intervention, the dots that aren't yellow, and ask yourself a year later, how many of them adopted, and compare it to the left-hand side, the untreated network. So what we want to do is, is we want to compare the untreated people in the treated village to the untreated people in the untreated village, and that difference will be a measure of the spillover effect. It will be a measure of the power of networks to foster contagion and create spreading. But then imagine that instead of just naively picking six people at random, we use algorithms, we use network algorithms to target individuals based on rational theory about who is most likely to be influential. So for example, instead of picking six people at random, we pick the six central individuals in this system. Now, the same intervention has been administered to these six people. Maybe only three of the treated again adopt. But now, instead of these three people adopting, maybe they cause an additional 30 people in the system to adopt. And on the left-hand side, maybe just because of secular change, five people adopt. So we've turbocharged the intervention by, in the same village, choosing strategically who to intervene on, and in so doing, taking advantage of the power of social networks to magnify whatever they are seeded with. And we can experiment with all kinds of algorithms, and we have been, for accelerating the adoption of desirable behavior in human social systems. 
So let me close with a sort of a general remark on where I see the social sciences today and where we've been coming from. Over the centuries, social scientists have developed a number of overarching approaches to understanding human behaviors and human society. And one classic way of understanding collective human behavior is to examine the choices and actions of individuals. For example, we can see markets, elections, and riots as the mere byproduct of individuals' decisions to buy and sell goods, cast a ballot, or express anger. And the classic example of this approach, which is known as methodological individualism, is provided by Adam Smith's famous 18th century conception of markets as the simple sum of individuals' willingness to supply or demand a good. And of course, in the 19th century, another classic way of understanding collective human behavior dispensed with individuals and focused on groups with collective identities that cause people in these groups to act in concert. And some scholars in this tradition, such as Durkheim or Marx, believe that groups have their own consciousness imbuing them with an indivisible personality that cannot be deduced or understood from the actions of individuals. So Marx are, and Durkheim argue, you can't understand collective properties by studying individuals. You need to study whole groups at the same time. And this is known as methodological holism. And this approach sees social phenomena as having a totality that is distinct from the individuals and not reducible merely to the study of individuals. Now, in the 20th century, social scientists often focused and how the membership of individuals within groups via the sharing of particular traits or, or attributes, such as class or race, could help explain their behavior and collective phenomena. So the argument was if we just knew enough about people, their age, their sex, their race, their education, where they lived, and so forth, we could have a kind of linear or, no, or regression models and then make predictions about people's behavior and slot them into groups in this fashion. But I would argue that social network approaches, which are so much more possible in the 21st century, offer a deeper way of understanding human society. Social networks are about both individuals and groups, and indeed about how the former become the latter. Interconnections between people give rise to phenomena that are not present in individuals and not reducible to their solitary desires and actions. Given the data and computational tools at our disposal nowadays, we can understand this better than ever, and we can begin to use this understanding, coupled with big data, and the computational and analytic tools at our disposal to make the world a better place by deploying focused interventions that enhance everything from cooperation to political participation to other things like innovation, health, and well-being. Thank you.